Have you ever wondered if the resurrection actually happened? We're gonna talk about that today. Hey guys, there are two reasons that I am a Christian, and it's not because I was raised in a Christian home or in a church. First reason is this, I cannot escape the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. People accuse Christians of kind of leaving their brains at the door sometimes of the church, but here's the truth, 92 of the first 100 universities in the Western world were founded by the church. The crux of it is this, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then the resurrection is the single most important event in all of history. And if you're honest, the only logical response is to dedicate your entire life to him. Now it is possible to believe in the resurrection and not let it impact your life, but if you wanna live authentically, and I know you do, it has to change it. So today I wanna to talk about the resurrection and at the end I'm gonna ask you to make a decision. If you're at the grocery store and you see a pile of apples and you pull that apple at the bottom, they all fall down, right? Well, the resurrection is the apple. But if it is pulled away, everything else goes. So you want to destroy Christianity? Prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Paul knew this. He says it in 1 Corinthians. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. In other words, if Jesus did rise, this is all a waste of time, just walk away. We should all leave the church and never come back if it didn't happen. On the other hand, if he did, nothing else matters. If Jesus went to the grave and he came out alive, that it should be the point on which our entire lives pivot. There was a man named Gulad Ahmed, who was a militant Muslim, he says this, he says, in your war against Christianity, Attack at the point of the resurrection. If you can convince them Jesus did not rise from the dead, you have won the battle. If there's no resurrection, in other words, then it's just one more philosophy. It's just a bunch of ideas. It's just another religion. But here's the thing. The tombs of Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius, all of those are shrines. But if you visit the tomb of Jesus, it is a shrine, but there is one important difference. There's no body in it. There's no other religion that claims that its founder died and came back to life Again, and this is what separates Christianity from everything else. If Jesus rose, then that proved that he was God. And if he's God, we have to believe everything he said was true. And he said this, he said, I am the only way to God the Father. So today, we're gonna explore the resurrection. Was it fact? Was it fiction? There are a lot of people who have tried to disprove it. There was a man named Simon Greenleaf who was a professor of law at Harvard in the 1800s. He wrote the definitive work on court evidence, presenting court evidence. And, and as an, there was an atheist in his class, a student who challenged him to take the laws and apply it to the resurrection. And so to get the student off his back, he did that. And in the process, he became a committed follower of Jesus. He said, evidence such as we have that supports the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead has never failed in a court of law. It was so compelling to him that no judge would rule against that evidence. Another two men, Benjamin Gilbert West and Lloyd Littleton, they were both atheists and they hated Christianity. West had a plan. He said, I'm going to prove Jesus never rose. And Littleton's plan was, I'm going to prove that Saul was never converted. He just kind of started his own religion. They went off on their own. And two years later, they came back together. They were embarrassed because both of them had become committed followers of Jesus Christ. Both of them said the sheer weight of evidence forced us to conclude that he rose. Another man, Dr. Frank Morrison, was an atheist. He talked about the scourge of Christianity and he set out to prove it wrong. And then he wrote a book called, Who Moved the Stone? The chapter one of that book was called, The Book That Refused to Be Written. And it's the story of how he came to the opposite conclusion and devoted himself to Jesus. Lee Strobel was a journalist and a skeptic and he set out to prove the resurrection wasn't real. Eventually in his process, he became a Christian and a pastor and he wrote a book called The Case for Christ. What was the evidence that these men came up with? I wanna walk you through these things. One of them was this, that Jesus was a literal historical person. He was from history. Now, scholars used to challenge 
this, but, but nobody has recently. There's enough archeological evidence. There's, there's more than 10 ancient documents that mention him. Uh, one of them is, is Tacitus, this uh, secular historian. He wrote the story of how Rome burned. He said this, he said, Nero, falsely charged with the guilt and punished with the most exquisite tortures, the persons commonly known as Christians who were hated for their enormities. He says, Christ, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, the procurator of Judea during the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, that's Christianity, repressed for a time, broke out again, not only through, Judah, through Judea, but where, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, that's Tacitus. And so the second thing is this, the fact that Jesus was crucified and laid in a tomb. Josephus, another historian, wrote this. He said, at this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus and his conduct was good. He was known to be virtuous and many people from among the Jews and other nations because of his disciples followed him. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and was alive accordingly. Perhaps he says he was the Messiah concerning who the prophets have recounted wonders. That's Flavius Josephus a secular historian recording that Jesus lived and was crucified. His body was laid in a tomb. It was a cave, probably four or four and a half feet high, hollowed into solid rock. Now, the third thing is this, three days later, the tomb was empty. How do we know that? Well, if it wasn't empty, Christianity wouldn't exist. Here's how that would have worked. After the, he was crucified, the disciples basically said, I guess we were wrong. And they went back fishing. It wasn't until three days later, each one of them claimed to have a personal encounter with Jesus. And they established the church at that point. Now you cannot argue there's no empty tomb. Another reason is this. The disciples preached Jesus Christ risen in the same city that he walked. Anybody could have walked out to the tomb to see it for themselves. How would this work? Here, here's kind of how it would work. If Phil Hamrick, who is our worship pastor, established the Hamrickites, his followers, and his message was this. Lake Norman is going to turn into cement. Now, if you were a critic, you would just like turn on the TV or you would drive out there and see if that actually had happened. Now, people could walk out to the tomb. They could have said, nope, he's still in there. They didn't because they couldn't because it was empty. And if you doubt, you have to at least take into account those three givens that Jesus was a person, he was crucified and the tomb was empty. So I want to walk you through four theories to, that the people have used to explain away the resurrection. One of them is this. On Easter, Mary, Martha, Salome, the other women, they went to the wrong tomb. Now, Jesus was just in another tomb around the corner, and in their excitement, they went to the wrong tomb. Peter and John ran to the wrong tomb. The other disciples, they ran to the wrong tomb. The Pharisees, they ran out, and they went to the wrong tomb. And then you have to believe that 16 Roman guards were lying unconscious around the wrong tomb, and a stone was blown away up a hill in front of the wrong tomb, and Joseph of Arimathea, who owned the tomb, couldn't find it. That one doesn't really work. The second theory is this. Well, maybe the disciples stole the body. So there was a meeting on Saturday of disciples and they're like, we're a joke. We're the town joke. So let's go down to the tomb. Let's pay off the guards. Let's steal the body. We're going to bury it. And tomorrow the women will find it empty and we will be heroes. They concocted the idea, the theory goes, of a resurrection as a hoax. Great theory, except that 10 out of the 11 disciples were put to death for telling about Jesus. Now, here's a question for you. Do 10 smart people give their lives for something that they know is a lie? Thomas in India, there were hundreds of people surrounding him saying, just say he didn't rise and we will let you live. And they had a knife to his throat. And if it was a lie, he could have just said, yeah, it's true. We just hid the body. Instead, Thomas looked at them. He said, I know that man walked out of the grave alive and they slit his throat and he died. The disciples were convinced so much so that they gave their own lives. The 11th was exiled. And there's another problem. The Bible says the Pharisees asked Pilate to seal the tomb. Now, that means a thin rope was stretched across the cave, sealed with wax, and Pilate's signet ring was placed on it. And the crime of tampering at that point went from a misdemeanor to an imperial offense. And the third thing is this. Maybe the Pharisees stole the body, like they had a meeting. Caiaphas said that the disciples are going to steal the body, and they're going to claim he rose. It's going to be even worse than ever. So let's go steal it ourselves, and we will hide the body from them. Problem is this. If their enemies had the body, why didn't they just produce it? Like, like Peter at Pentecost in the book of Acts, he's saying, Jesus, you murdered. The Jesus you murdered, God has raised and made Lord and Christ. And they could have just produced the body right then and there, and the church would have died on the spot. They couldn't do it because they had no idea where the body 
was. Now, the fourth theory is a little more complex. It's called the Passover plot. It's basically that the resurrection was an illusion. It was a trick pulled off by Jesus, who was an evil man trying to prove that he was God. Uh, Jesus and his disciples decided ahead of time, we're going to tell the world that, that Jesus was God, and they knew he was going to get crucified. And so the theory is that I, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a cue, and that was him saying the words, I thirst. And John brought up a sponge, remember, with the straw to Jesus' lips, and in that was bitter wine and vinegar, and the theory was it was actually a mixture of drugs, like myrrh and aloe, put him in a coma. N no one in that day would have known he was barely alive, and then a few days later, the potion would wear off, Jesus would get up, and he would walk out of the tomb. Now, here's why this is impossible. He was beat 39 times with something called a flagrum. It was a two foot long stick, nine thongs of leather dipped in sheep's blood, rolled in pottery or jagged metal or bone. And the idea with that was to rip the flesh off in tiny strips. And a lot of men died from this beating. And Jesus had that. And then he fell carrying the cross. The other two thieves didn't. Why? Because he was the only one in history, in the history of Rome probably, who was flogged and then crucified. Why? Because Pilate wimped out. He tried Jesus. He knew that Jesus was innocent, but he wanted to pacify the people. And so he had him flogged, not crucified. If he did that, maybe they would relent. But the people shouted, crucify him. And Jesus was forced to carry a cross after that beating. Now, the crucifixion spikes were, were nailed through his wrists. The Greek word for the hand includes the forearm, so it wouldn't tear away through the main artery. And, and so it went through the main artery. And, and, and there were four Roman guards who had to sign his death certificate. If anybody came off of the cross alive by accident, all of those guards had to be put to death. So Jesus was stripped naked in the street, tied together with the clothes soaked. Their clothes would have been soaked in oil and they were saying, hey, he looks dead, but they weren't sure, so they thrust a spear in his side. Now, now, John says, out of that side flowed blood and water, which is an unmistakable sign of death. The, the heart stops beating, the blood separates from the water and settles into the lower two-thirds of the body. And so water rises, and the spear would have caused blood followed by water. They took the body off the cross. They embalmed the body in a mummy-like fashion. They would take strips of cloth. They'd wrap the body in, in, from, from the ankles up to the armpits, up to the head, and, and put a shroud on him. And now inside each layer of cloth were spices mixed with water, and it made it kind of gummy. And after two days, it would be like a full body cast. So if he was alive, he wouldn't have been able to move. Now, the stone, scientists at Georgia Tech uh, uh, said that probably about two tons, it would take about 20 men to move it. The Roman guards, there were 16 Roman guards so that no one touched the seal. Now, they were the most advanced fighting machine the world had ever known. A, a Roman soldier was trained to guard six square yards of ground. They had six different weapons on their body and a shield. So here's the summary of this. This is the, the thought, the, the, the theory. Jesus survived the worst beating anyone has ever survived. And he faked an unmistakable sign of death on the cross before anybody even knew it was an unmistakable sign of death. Two days later, with no medical help whatsoever, he jumps up, he hops over to the cave, he throws a two-ton stone out of the way up a hill, and he tackles 16 Roman guards, and he you know, ties them up with his mummy clothes, and he proclaims himself Lord of the universe. It takes more faith to believe in that than to believe Jesus rose from the dead. The only real conclusion that we're left with is this. On Friday, Jesus was dead. On Saturday, his body was decomposing. On Sunday, he walked out of the grave alive, no longer the bloody Lamb of God, but Jesus, the risen Lord. And the final nail in the coffin is this, the response of his family in Mark chapter 3. In Mark 3, his brothers hated him. He was the, they were the little brother of Jesus. They don't believe he was the Son of God, but after the resurrection... You can count the entire family of Jesus among the disciples. James, his brother, was leading the church in Jerusalem. And you can see that he wrote the whole book of James. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus visited James. And James, always a skeptic, comes face to face with the reality of the resurrection. And he has no choice but to make Jesus the Lord of his life. When you look at the evidence... It is just hard to deny that Jesus walked out alive and if Jesus rose, he was God. And if he's God, then our only choice is to surrender our lives, our minds, our hearts, and our souls to him. And there's a second reason I'm a Christian too. My own encounter with Jesus when I was 12. I felt the power of how personal he is. Come sit down beside me at a camp and I felt his presence. And I heard about why he came and I surrendered. The book of John says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children 
of God. The evidence for the resurrection is there. It's in plain sight and you can receive him, you can believe in him and you can become his child as John says today. All it takes is a yes. And if you're ready to do that today, I wanna invite you to simply pray with me and say yes with me. Let's pray. God, on behalf of those who are praying with me to begin a relationship with you, I just admit that in my own sin, I'm stuck. And as I consider this faith, as I consider the evidence for your resurrection, I'm just simply overwhelmed by it. And I admit that I need you. And as John said, I receive you and I believe in your name that you came to the cross, not simply as a historical act, but also for me, that spiritually I'm dead, but through the cross and your resurrection, you have made me alive again. And today I say yes to a relationship with you. So I invite you into my life. I invite you into my heart. I surrender myself to you. Would you lead my life for me, Jesus. I pray this in your mighty name, amen. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well. That never runs dry Drink of the water Come and thirst no more And come all you sinners Come find His mercy Come to the table He will satisfy Taste of His goodness And find what you're looking for It's one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live forever Bring all your failures Bring your addictions Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms See His open arms For God so loved the world that He gave us It's one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live
down at the foot of the cross and Jesus is waiting God so loved the world Well, we're so grateful that you joined us today. We believe that everyone has a next step to take and I would love to offer a few that you might be interested in. The first is going to our website, lovelkn.org. There you can find information about our church. You can find ways to get connected and you can find a connection card. Now that connection card only takes about 30 seconds to fill out and it's a great way for you to take a step into the life of this church. Another next step that you may be interested in is giving. We view giving as an act of worship and a response to God's goodness. We never want giving to be done out of shame or guilt, but always motivated by joy. You can learn more information about giving at lovelkn.org slash gift. Last but not least, we would love to see you in person. We meet each week at 9 and 1030 at the Oak Street Mill, and we want to invite you and your family to join us. Thank you so much for being here. Hope to see you soon.